Matthew chapter 7. I like the story about a, a guy who was at the bar. He was leaving the bar and he knew he was too drunk to drive home. And so he decided he'd just walk home. And it's kind of in the town square and his home was located on the opposite end of the square from where he had been and had gotten so inebriated. And in the middle of the town square was the town's cemetery. And this cemetery, they had just dug a fresh grave for a funeral following the next day. And it's dark. But he thinks to himself, I can save time by cutting across the cemetery to get home. And wouldn't you know it, as he's walking through the cemetery without seeing it, he falls into the, to the grave. And he tried for a while to, to claw his way out. He couldn't jump high enough. He couldn't reach to the, to the ledge to pull himself out. So he said, I'll just throw my coat over me and I'll sleep here for the night. Then somebody in the morning will see me and get me out. Wouldn't you know it that there was a guy just walking around town that evening and he thought, I think I'll just take a stroll around the square. And he thought, I'm going to walk through the cemetery. The gate's open for some reason. I'm going to walk through there. And he falls into the same hole. And he knows that he's in trouble. And he's clawing his way out. He's trying to, to, to get leverage. He just can't get a hold of the, the side of the dirt. Keeps crumbling on him. And after about two or three minutes of exerting all this energy and, and sweating, he feels a hand on his shoulder. And the voice behind says, you might as well give it up, buddy. You're never going to get out of here. But he did. <laughs> what motivates you? Let me ask this question this morning. How are you doing? I mean, how are you doing? I'm, I'm talking to you personally. I, so much of what I preach on, and I, I've reflected on this lately about some of my sermons, and I've been not really in a series in a while, but I've been thinking about collectively how we're all in this together. How many of you have heard that expression? We're all in this together. This morning, I'm going to do it a little different. I'm going to ask you about you. When, there are some times, do you know, there are some times that you're not in it together with everybody else. And, and while that might be confusing and daunting and somewhat embarrassing and maybe feels lonely, on the other hand, sometimes it's a good thing I'm not like everybody else, you know? It's a good thing I'm not in the situation everybody else is in and you can start thinking about your blessings and how well off you are. You can always think of somebody that has worse circumstances than yourself. There's always someone worse off than you. And I know that my sermons have lately been how we as a church do this, how we as a group do this, how we as a, a nation or a community, are, it, we're all in this together, but there are times that you're not in it together. And that can be a good thing. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 7 beginning in verse 13. And it's a long reading, so I'm going to have you engage with me in this reading, as I sometimes do, pausing and prompting for you to say the word that comes next. Are you ready? Okay, this is going to flop. Are you ready? Okay, we might have a go of this. Here we go. Enter through the narrow what? For wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. Watch out for false. They come to you in sheeps. But inwardly they are ferocious. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good what? But a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit. And a bad tree cannot bear good. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus by their fruit you will recognize them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of. 
but only the one who does the will of my who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your, and in your, drive out demons and in your, perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you what? Verse 24, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the what? The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that. Yet it did not because it had its foundation on the. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the. The rain came down, the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell with a great. And when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were. At his teaching. Because he taught as one who had. And not as their teachers of the law. Let's pray. Father thank you for this morning that we have. To center on this part of the Sermon on the Mount. To think about how personally we're doing. With you. With the world. With the word of God. How we're doing with ourselves. How we're doing with family. And that we might make any adjustments necessary to make sure that we don't miss heaven. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. This is the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus never closed a sermon with, uh, shall we stand and sing? But he always left us with an action take-home point. Several actually. And he prompted questions that you and I ought to be asking ourselves because he wants this to be real life stuff. There's a so what factor when listening to Jesus' sermons. He would not just teach you a point about life. He would imply with whatever ordinary everyday example he'd give as a parable that there was an application for you and for me in that teaching. Yeah, the mustard seed is small. Jesus said it, it's a fact. It's small. But what's that mean to you? What's that mean to me? That's where he wanted us to be practical and apply Faith as small of a, as a mustard seed would do what? Move what? Mountains. Mountains. And there are some questions. And Jesus is really good about asking questions. Anytime he was ever being cornered, he would ask a question back. He would turn the table. But Jesus would know how to also ask questions in his rhetoric. To imply that there's something he wants that he expects of us. In that question we should know the answer. And while there might be some stated questions or maybe not stated questions. I think there are questions especially from this section. That we ought to be asking ourselves given what Jesus has just taught on. Because here's the thing. Jesus is very concerned that there will be people while they may think they're right, they may think they are well informed, may think that they have the right motive, will in some way, somehow, miss heaven. And the very first part that we read is about people that are going to miss heaven. And later on down, he's going to talk about how some people that are going to miss heaven didn't realize they were going to miss heaven. Probably just about everybody you know, if you were to ask them, are you going to go to heaven? They'd like to think that they are. At least they want to. Don't you agree? Do you want to go to heaven? Would you like to think that you are going to heaven? I would hope that you do. Often you've heard me say that you and I as disciples of Christ ought to know we're going. Not just, I hope, I hope so. If I've done enough good stuff over bad stuff, maybe he'll let me in. I know Melba doesn't always talk like that, but no, I'm kidding, Melba. <laughs> uh, there are many of us that just sometimes we need that affirmation. Let me, let me just do this for you this morning. This, if nothing else, this ought to make you feel better. Raise your hand if you believe Jesus is the Son of God. 
Okay? Raise your hand or keep them up if you want, if you believe he died for your sins. And raise your hand or keep them up if you were baptized, if you've been clothed with Christ and you are now in Christ and have access to the forgiveness of sins. Let me tell you something. You're going to heaven. You're going to heaven. Now, some of y'all get more excited about going to a shopping mall. Let me say it one more time. You're going to heaven. Does that make you feel better? Now, I want you to do this. Look at your neighbor and say to them, you have a place in heaven. I hope that if nothing else, you forget that corny joke that I told at the beginning and you know for sure on your way home today, no matter what, you're going to go to heaven because you need to know that. And it was so important that Jesus says, this is what the tail end of my sermon here that's going to be known for all ages as the Sermon on the Mount. This last part is about making sure everybody has just warm fuzzies built on false notions. But you do know without a doubt, with no reservation, that you're on the right track. Look at verse 13 and 14. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. Most people are on that path. It's many contrasted with few. The few that are on the small road. The small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life. And one depicts heaven and the other depicts hell. And I hope that you're on the path to heaven. And so my question to you, the first question of three that I'm going to ask is, will I walk the narrow way? I want you to ask yourself that. Will I walk the narrow way instead of the popular way. Because you realize what Jesus said, don't you? The narrow way is not popular. This is the true test of self-denial, a part of the cost of discipleship when Jesus said, any man who follows me must first what? Deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. The path Jesus walked was not easy. And it wasn't popular. One way is easy. The other has work involved. One way is comfortable. The other has difficulty. One way is convenient. The other is lonely. And while in the church, yes, all of us in the church can say, we're all in this together. But in your community and perhaps even in your family or whatever other culture groups or small subgroups you are involved in in your daily life, you have to be willing to admit we're not all in this together. Because of what Jesus said, many are on the wrong path and just a few on the right path. So sometimes we're not all in this together. Now we want to be able to say that, don't we? We want people joining us. Who's that walking heaven's road carrying such a... And we want people walking the heaven's road with us, right? Right? We do. We want to go to heaven with all of our friends. Most of them. We want to go to heaven with our family. All of them, right? We want to go to, fam we want to, go to heaven with everybody we know. This is the test of self-denial right here. And there's some people that couldn't pass this test. Paul spoke of uh, a guy by the name of Demas in 2 Timothy chapter 4 in verse 10. Paul is writing to Timothy and he's asking Timothy to come quickly because Demas had deserted him. This is 2 Timothy 4 verse 10. For Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia and Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you. But he says, Demas, because he loved this world. If you love the world, it's hard to walk on a narrow path. 
So ask yourself the question, will I walk the narrow way? The second question is this. What comes from my life? Think about that for a moment. What's, what comes from my life, my existence on this earth? What, what are the benefits of others from my being here? Go back to the sermon in Matthew 7 at verse 15. And Jesus says, watch out for false prophets that come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit, you will recognize them. So he's talking about people with bad motives, bad intention, who has the agenda of setting people astray, distracting and interrupting their spiritual growth. And he says, verse 17, likewise, every good tree bears good fruit and a bad tree bears bad fruit. And he says, verse 18, a good tree cannot bear bad fruit and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down, thrown in the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. And so the question is, what are the fruits of your life? What's the fruit that you're producing? Now, Jesus is pointing out, watch out for those who are not producing good fruit. And they can be in your midst. They can be around you. You're hearing their voices sometimes. It may be in the form of a, of a social media, a news, radio, music, uh, gossip. It may be in the form of even teaching that you may have heard before. Because there was false teaching. And Jesus is saying you need to be aware, very aware of that. But if you read between the lines, there's the implied point that Jesus wants all of us to make sure that what's coming out of our mouth, what's coming out of our life, what's coming out of our being here is good fruit, right? He taught this in John chapter 15 when he says that he was the vine, we were the branches, and every branch of me must bear fruit. John 15 verse 8. There's fruit bearing that needs to be in our life. That's growth. That's development. That's positive results. You can take a look at 2 Peter chapter 1 and you can read those virtues that you're to add to your life. Uh, goodness, kindness, self-control, brotherly kindness. All those things that we add to our faith, Peter says. You can, you can go to where Paul wrote about bringing the fruit of the Spirit into our life. And we've memorized the fruit of the Spirit before and the fruit of our lips in Hebrews, which is our sacrifice of praise, our singing, and the fruit of holiness, according to Romans 6.32, or the fruit of God's works, Colossians 1.10. And of course, I think also bearing much fruit is involving our lives in the reaching out to lost souls and bringing them to be where we are. So what comes from my life is the second question. Will I walk the narrow way and what's coming from my life? The third question is this. Am I doing as well as I am saying? Am I doing as well as I'm saying? Look at verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. He says in verse 22, many will say to me on that, Lord, uh, on that day, Lord, Lord. In verse 24, we read, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Verse 26, Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man built his house on the sand. Verse 28, Jesus finished saying these things. The crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority, not as their teachers of the law. What is his point? You see, he's contrasting the ones that say, Lord, Lord, they're saying this. Lord, we did this. We did that. And the Lord says, I'm going to say to them, depart from me. But those who are hearing my words and putting them into practice, I will be to them like the rock that they're building their house on. And he says, this will be the case for every one of you who is not just saying, but they're doing. They're doing. They're putting action to their words. They are obedient to what they're professing. They're practicing what they're preaching. They're committed not just by mouth alone, but their lives are involved in it. And Jesus said, 
That vain worship was when people come here and they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And Jesus expects us to have all of our being involved in this narrow walk of discipleship. One of the verses I shared with you last Sunday in that sermon, Can't We All Just Get Along, was the Colossians 3.17, whatever you do in word or deed, what you say or what you do, in other words, do all in the name of the, you remember this? Lord. Whatever it is. It's the test of obedience. James says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Don't you feel like that back in Matthew 7, 21, these people who are coming up to Jesus saying, Lord, Lord, haven't we done this? Haven't we done that? Don't you feel like they had deceived themselves thinking that they were right, but they weren't? And James goes on to say, and so deceive yourselves, do what it says. Don't merely listen to the word do what it says. You ever gone to your neighbor, got into a discussion, and you bring up a verse, and, oh, yeah, my Bible says this. I know it says that. Well, have you done that? <laughs> well, I know that it says that. I believe it says that. I believe that. But have you done that? Am I doing as well as I'm saying? So, in this sermon, not this sermon, but this sermon of Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount, one of the biggest questions Jesus asked, it's early on in this ch chapter, it's not in the text that we read this morning, but he's asked, will your righteousness be different than the righteousness of everybody else? What more are you wanting to do than others? You see, the way that we grow a church the way that we grow individually, the way that we follow Jesus all the way to the finish line is not by talking it and saying it. It's not just by singing it either. It's when we actually live it and do it. That's where it happens. How are you doing? That was my question I first asked. How are you doing? Are you walking the narrow way? Are you willing to do that? What's coming from your life? And are you doing as well as you are saying? And this morning, if you can see that within yourself, maybe I don't match up to where I need to be, I'm here to motivate you. I'm the guy in the grave with you. Okay, I'm the drunk. I'm maybe not a comparable thing. But I'm the guy in the grave with you, putting my hand on the back of your shoulder so you can get yourself out of from where you're at right now. So you can move on and grow. To move forward in this life. To, to make 2021 a great year. You may not be in this all together with everybody else. Because again, it's not that popular. But if you're willing to make some changes today. And you see the need to make some changes. And you need to express that in front of your church family. This is a time now that we will get behind you. Support you. And reinforce whatever we need to do. To help you become greater than you are now. Won't you come as together we stand and sing.